All right, it is now time for our lecture on arthropods. So this word arthropoda means jointed feet. That arthro is the same root as the word arthritis, which is inflammation of your joints. Our arthropods include things like crustaceans, insects, arachnids, and more. Um, but it's hard to put them all in a group because there are over one million known species of arthropods and scientists estimate there may be as many as 80 million species of them. So we got a whole lot of arthropods. For our arthropods, they do all have some things in common. Their symmetry is bilateral. Right? Like with this lobster, you could cut it neatly right down the middle to get two mirror image halves. For segmentation, they do have a segmented body. Those segments are sometimes externally separated. What we mean by that is if you look at this lobster, right, on the tail, for example, you can see separate segments. However, in this fused cephalothorax region, you can't. So sometimes those segments are visible on the outside and sometimes they are not. However, whether they are or are not visible on the outside, unlike an anilid, anilid they are not internally separated. There are no membranes between these segments. And these segments may or may not be repeated. So for example, on that lobster, the legs are repeated, right, our walking legs. However, our claws are not. They've only got one set of claws. And generally speaking, our arthropods have three regions, the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. each with its own set of segments in it. And each arthropod segment typically has paired appendages. So appendage is basically something that sticks off the body. So these appendages can include things like claws, legs, antenna, wings, things like eye stalks, and even mouth parts or tails. Those are all possible paired appendages that our arthropods may have. If we take a look at their digestive system, they have a separate mouth and anus, so they have a complete digestive system. And we can see that just like our annelids, they have a ventral nerve cord with a simple brain. For their circulatory system, their circulatory system is open, meaning that while there are is are a series of hearts with vessels, okay? Um, the heart pumps that blood into the body cavity. The blood, or actually in an insect, is called a hemolymph. The blood or hemolymph washes over the organs and then comes back into the heart to be pumped out again. All right. Um, so lastly, their skeleton. Arthropods, as many of us know, have an exoskeleton. So it is on the outside of their body, not the inside. It is made of chitin. And just for reference, that is not pronounced chitin. It's pronounced like kite in, okay? Um, chitin is a fairly proteinaceous substance. Um, sometimes if it is a marine arthropod or an ocean dwelling one, they may have some calcium carbonate in there as well to help strengthen their shell. Barnacles are a good example of an arthropod that has calcium carbonate in their shell. All right, so if they have this hard exoskeleton on the outside, arthropods face some challenges. First challenge is how do they move, okay? So this hard exoskeleton, the joints of it are actually thinner spots 
in the exoskeleton so that they are thinner, they are able to bend. All right, and their muscles pull on the insides of their skeletons. This is different from us. Our muscle pulls on the outside of our skeleton. All right. Now another challenge for these arthropods is growing. Um, and to grow, they need to molt. Molting is basically shedding the exoskeleton in order to grow. We are going to watch a video of this and then identify the steps in molting. The arthropods' dominance of the sea was greatly aided by one of the most important aspects of their body plan, their skeleton. An arthropod wears its skeleton outside its body. This hard shell serves not only as support, but as body armor, shielding its soft inner organs from harm. There are times, however, when an arthropod must leave its armor behind. In order to grow, it undergoes one of the most amazing transformations in the animal kingdom. First, the mounting pressures of its growing body crack open its exoskeleton. Beneath the shell, a soft, new skeleton has been developing. In less than 30 minutes of struggling and squirming, this crab breaks free of its old skeleton, a process called molting. It emerges with an entirely new covering, from legs to body to eyes. Its soft new skeleton will inflate quickly to a larger shell and harden during the next two days. For the soft shell crab, a prized meal of many predators and humans, it's a dangerous two days. Right, so having seen that video, we know that in order to grow, if you've got this hard exoskeleton on the outside of your body, you need to be able to shed that skeleton and make a new one. So that's our molting process. What are the steps in molting? As we saw with the blue crab, our first step is that the exoskeleton cracks. Okay, then typically the arthropod will somehow wiggle out. Uh, many times this is out kind of like the posterior and ventral side, although there are a few that will come out more towards the anterior end of their body. Then after that new um, soft shelled um, arthropod comes out, it will still it will puff up while it's still soft. This is kind of like when you buy shoes that are a size or two too big for where you are right now. Um, because you know that your feet are still growing. So they inflate their shell, um, and then once it hardens, they'll deflate inside, so they've got some room to grow. They then hide while their shell hardens. And they will grow and can even regenerate limbs that have been lost inside the new shell. And then they'll repeat the process. So that's what molting looks like. 
um, and they need to use it to grow. Now, an additional challenge comes for arthropods with something called metamorphosis. So metamorphosis, we're familiar with this in frogs, is changing or maturing from one body form to another. And because of their hard exoskeleton in arthropods, this requires molting. You can't change shape with a hard skeleton on the outside. So we'll look at a few different kinds of metamorphosis. Our first one is crustacean metamorphosis. Crustaceans start at eggs. They hatch into typically pelagic or planktonic zoea. Um, they then metamorphose and molt again to become a megalopa and then eventually juvenile crabs. As juvenile crabs, they'll go through several molts and then at a certain point, they will become an adult crab. Um, the adult crab, what's different about them compared to the juveniles is these guys are able to sexually reproduce. And what is different for, for crustaceans versus other arthropods like our insects is these guys can keep molting and growing as adults. All right, this is not the case for most of our insects. So let's take a look at insect metamorphosis. Most of us are fairly familiar with complete metamorphosis. This is a butterfly's life cycle, um, and it's the stages we are pretty familiar with. We start as an egg, okay, out of the egg comes a larva. The larva may molt and grow a few times until we get a large larva, at which point it turns into a pupa, and then an adult. What is different with the adults um, here is that that molt into an adult is the last molt. Adult insects cannot continue to molt and grow larger and larger. So a few things about this life cycle that are really cool that we don't often think of. Many times we think of a caterpillar making a chrysalis around itself um, or putting a, um, or moth caterpillar putting a cocoon around itself. And then that's how it gets its pupa, but that's not actually true. The pupa is actually inside the larva, and what the larva does is it molts and takes off that outer layer of exoskeleton skeleton to get to the pupa. There's a really good video of this on our um, biology page. I encourage you to watch it. Then inside the pupa, a lot of times, especially kids' books will tell us, oh, the caterpillar grows wings and becomes a beautiful butterfly, and that is false. Inside the pupa, the caterpillar turns completely to slime. Its cells undifferentiate. Um, and then there's two pieces of tissue from up near its brain that still contain the genetic information and redirect the building of a whole new body inside that pupa. Um, so it's a lot more drastic than we often think of. When the adult hatches out, it then has to dry out, pump some of that blood and fluid into its wings, and then it can fly off and lay eggs. So like we said, and like this example shows, most of us know about butterflies and moths as insects that can do this kind of metamorphosis. However, flies, bees, ants, and beetles are just a few of the other insects that also go through this type of metamorphosis. Um, beetle larvae are called grubs, fly larvae are maggots. So we've got lots that do complete metamorphosis. And our other type of insect metamorphosis is unsurprisingly called incomplete metamorphosis. This is the one we're less familiar with. So in this one, it starts as an egg, and out of the egg comes a nymph. And the nymph may look like a small adult, like in this grasshopper, or it may have a different form, like in a dragonfly or a cicada, where the nymph doesn't look anything like the adult. Um, the nymph goes through several molts and gets larger and larger. And eventually, after its last molt, will become an adult. The difference for this adult is the adult is sexually mature, and it is only at this stage that the insect has wings. It does not have wings as a juvenile or a nymph. Okay. Um, some examples of these, or of insects that go through incomplete metamorphosis, are things like grasshoppers and crickets, 
dragonflies and mosquitoes, cicadas, and our friends, the cockroaches. Okay, so now let's take a look at how we classify all of these diverse arthropods. So you don't need to know the names of the subphyla for our class. This is just in case you want to know how it's organized. So within arthropods, one of our subphylums is mandibulata, meaning they have mandibles or certain mouth parts. And one of our big groups in there is our class crustacea. Crustaceans have two pairs of antenna. And most of them are aquatic and have gills. Some examples of our crustaceans are things like crabs, lobsters and crayfish, barnacles, krill, including plankton from SpongeBob, and our only terrestrial um, crustacean, which is our roly polies, more form formally known as isopods. All right. These crustaceans, we don't always think about them, but they are very important in ocean food webs and in the human economy as a source of food. So those are our crustaceans. Our next class is our class Insecta. These guys have just one pair of antenna, and there are over one million known species of insects. Um, scientists expect, or some predict, that there may be over 80 million species of insects. We just haven't seen most of them. So let's take a basic dive into insect anatomy. Most of us have been learning for a long time that insects have three basic body parts. You can draw this along with me in your notes. They have the head, the thorax, and the abdomen. So what can we expect to find on each of these three body regions? On the head, we have the eye, the antenna, the mouth parts, and typically some kind of brain. Okay. On the thorax, we have things like wings, and proper legs, okay? We've got three pairs of legs on an insect's thorax. And then in the abdomen is actually where most of their organs are. The thorax is kind of empty except for flight muscles. So we've got our heart, the digestive system, the reproductive system, and the bulk of the respiratory system are found in the abdomen. You may also find additional legs here in the abdomen. So for someone like Grub and it's Bug's Life, you would see those additional legs there. All right, so now let's talk about insect flight. Flight actually evolved first in insects before any other animals. And insects are characterized by having zero to two pairs of wings. Sometimes we see both of these wings clearly, like on a dragonfly. Uh, let's see, where's our dragonfly? We don't have it, but on a butterfly, we've got two clear pairs of wings. On something like a beetle, however, the top wing is actually going to be a hard covering, and the bottom wing is the one that they will use for flying. Um, so some advantages of flight, which is one of their, these advantages are some of the reasons why insects were able to colonize so much of the world is because they can fly. So if you fly, you can escape predators more easily. You can also find food more easily. You can be choosier about finding your mates because you've got more access to them. Um, you can find new habitat or better habitat. You can colonize new areas. You can even migrate. 
right? So those are our insects. A few other groups of arthropods, one of our classes is Myriapoda. This word means many feet. These guys have many segments with legs. and include things like millipedes, which have two pairs of legs per segment, and centipedes, which have just one pair of legs per segment. Another difference between these, millipedes are poisonous, meaning that they are toxic if you eat them, whereas centipedes are venomous, meaning they can inject a toxin into you. Our last group then of arthropods is our subphylum Chelicerata. Chelicera are these pinchers that appear behind the mouth, okay? Um, so we've got a few different classes in here. We've got class Arachnida, which has um, spiders, ticks, and things like scorpions, as well as class Meristomata, which is our horseshoe crabs, right? So those are our different arthropods. If we take a look at our cladogram, we see that they go on this branch and they are very similar to, similar to annelids. Um, they are segmented, they are protostomes. However, what makes an arthropod different from an annelid is that an arthropod has an exoskeleton. All right, so go ahead and watch our next video now, our Echinodermata.